listen to Jesus' word to us. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also, you go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, and about three o'clock, he did the same, and about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing and around, and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, well, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you also, you go into the vineyard. Now when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. Now when those hired about five o'clock came, each of them... Each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, it is hard to forget it when you feel like you've been treated unfairly. Back when I was in college, ooh, there I am. Back when, back when I was in college, or just after I graduated from college, I went to work for Dow Corning Corporation, and I worked at a plant in Kentucky, and then after two years, I was transferred to the corporate center in Michigan. And the woman that replaced me in Kentucky was straight out of college. And the rumor mill had it that they were paying her the same amount as they were paying me after by both years of my experience. Now, you can imagine how that went over, and so eventually I went into my boss's office and I said, look, this is no way to run a business. You can't pay her the same amount as you're paying me. After all of, well, after both of my long years of experience, there is no way she should be making the same as me. It's just not fair. Now, to his credit, he didn't fire me. He did invite me to go back to my office and pull down, and he said something to the effect of, well, don't worry, it'll get better as time passes. But that was... 27 years ago, and I still can't shake the thought that it simply wasn't fair. I mean, I think the only thing that would have been worse is if I had had to get up at 6 a.m. and work in the hot fields all day long and then find out some Johnny-come-lately that came in at 5 p.m. got paid the same amount as me. I mean, that's what Jesus says in this parable, right? That there's a rich landowner that needs some workers in his vineyard, so he goes out at 6 a.m. and he says, okay, now, you know, you're looking for work? Go work in the vineyard, work a full day, 12 hours, I'll pay you a full day's wage. Let's say it was $8 an hour, 12, 12 hours, $8, $96. They agree, they go into the vineyard. He goes back out at three, uh, 9, back out at noon, back out at 3, back out at 5, and these workers go to the vineyard, and then when it's time for them to get paid, the last ones to get to work are the first ones to get paid. And so they've worked an hour, so what are they expecting? How much money? 
$8, right? And what do they get? $96. They cannot believe it. They didn't earn it. They didn't deserve it. They could not believe it. They are so happy. In fact, the, they're the happiest people in the county. The only people happier than them are the 6 a.m. workers who start thinking to themselves, they think, well, you know, I don't know what 12 times 96 is, and neither do I know what 12 times 96 is, but they knew that it was a lot more than $96, and so when it comes their time to get paid, they're so eager, and then they get $96. So what do they say? It's not fair. And I think for most of us, we say it too, right? I mean, raise your hand if you kind of associate with the 6 a.m. workers in this parable, right? Yeah, I see a lot of hands going up. You kind of place yourself with these 6 a.m. workers. But what if we could place ourselves somewhere else? Not with the ones that were so sure they deserved more, but someone else. That's what my friend... Susie does, when she reads this parable, I told her I was preaching on this, and she said, oh, I love that parable, which was crazy, because every other person says that parable is not fair at all, right? But she said, Susie said, no, I love that parable. And I'm like, why do you love that parable? She says, I love that parable because I am always running late. <laughs> so what if we could be more like Susie and place ourselves as the 5 p.m. workers who did things that we never earned and didn't deserve. I mean, I think if we could place ourselves here, we'd be a lot more likely to see grace in the world. And I think we would have our eyes open to ways that we receive gifts that we didn't deserve and that we have advantages that we didn't earn. And I think if we were really being honest with ourselves, we would realize that these gifts and advantages come not just in society, but in the church. And that some of these gifts and advantages that are unearned come because of our race, for those of us who are white. That's why the PCUSA adopted the Belfar Confession, which you heard earlier. In 2016, it became a part of our book of confessions. Of you confirmation students back there, I remember when I was in confirmation, I thought the book of confessions was like a bunch of Presby famous people telling each other about their worst sins. <laughs> but it turns out the book of confessions is actually this, all the statements of faith that help us interpret the scripture. And so the Presbyterians, we adopted that in 2016 from the church of, in South Africa, the Dutch Reformed Mission Church. They had written it in 1982. Now the Dutch Reformed Mission Church was made up of people we would call biracial. No whites went there, no blacks went there, no Indians went there. And these biracial people were not allowed to go to the denominations which were for white people, or black people, or for Indians. And so the people in this Dutch Reformed Mission Church realized that that was not what God wanted. That God desired unity and reconciliation between races and not separation between races. And so they wrote the Belhar Confession to talk about reconciliation, to talk about justice, and to talk about unity. And to say that it didn't just happen out there in society, but it happened there in that Dutch Reformed family of churches in South Africa. And so last year, when the PCUSA adopted the Belhar Confession, we said also that these problems and the need for reconciliation and unity and justice between races is not just something out there in society, but it's also something for us in the church. Now, of course, our situation is nothing like the apartheid situation, right? I mean, that, that it's, uh, it was a, such an extreme situation there. I mean, think about our own denomination, which we know best. I and mean, of course, people can worship anywhere they want to worship. Any race can worship in any church. And 
Um, I noticed that even your nominating committee is called the Committee on Representation. We're a denomination that takes really seriously the need to have diverse backgrounds in leadership. And we have had moderators at local levels, moderators of the General Assembly, who have been people of color for decades. But that doesn't mean that racism does not lurk around in the corners and often make itself known in ways that we don't really want to think about. I was at a conference about a year and a half ago and got to hear a story from Princeton um, about, now this is a very extreme story, uh, but he, he's from Nigeria and he came to Oklahoma to study at college. He was a brand new Christian, came to Oklahoma to study and his first Sunday he wanted to go to church. And so he went to the nearest church, um, nearest the campus. It wasn't a PCUSA church. To the nearest church to campus, all white church. And so he goes there the first week and he said that when he came in the building, People kind of avoided him. And then he said after the service that someone told him that he wasn't welcome there. And he said, he said, I wasn't really sure that I understood them. He said people's accents in Oklahoma are different from people's accents in Nigeria. So he wasn't so sure that he actually understood them. So he went back the next week and they told him again that he wasn't welcome. But Princeton has the gift that the King James Version calls being long-suffering. And so Princeton went back a third week, confident that it would be different. And it was different this week. The pastor asked to see him after the service. And they walked outside. And the pastor told him, your kind is not welcome here. And then pulled his coat back to show him his gun. Now that's a very extreme story, of course. It's so extreme that sometimes it's hard for us to understand that it could even happen in the United States. But when I heard it, it was in the context of a Bible study that I was leading on this passage. And I started off the Bible study just to kick it off by asking about a time when people had been treated unfairly and I told my story about Dow Corning when I was sure that I should have made $2,000 more. And as Princeton told his story, sentence by sentence by sentence, it helped me realize how similar I was to the 5 p.m. workers. I had advantages that I didn't earn I didn't deserve, that Princeton simply didn't have. I could, you know, I could waltz into any church in the whole country and feel welcome. Like the five o'clock worker who waltzed in at five and got paid the same amount as the early birds. But see, Princeton, Princeton had to get up early thinking about, are they going to understand what I'm saying? Am I going to be able to understand them? Are they going to avoid me when I go into the sanctuary? Is the pastor going to pull a gun on me? Thoughts that I never have to think about when I go to church. And again, this is a very exaggerated example, right? It's racism that's not just lurking around the corner, but is front and center standing in the pulpit. But it doesn't mean that smaller things, hurtful things, don't happen in our churches. In fact, I bet if you asked the people of color who were here, you would be able to hear many stories about times in the church when they had felt dishonored or marginalized. I heard a story recently about a Hispanic man that was preaching in the Southwest in a Presbyterian church. He's a Presbyterian pastor, was preaching in a Presbyterian church. And um, after the service, there were these two um, older ladies. It was an all-white church. These two older ladies came out, and they, um, I think they intended to compliment him. And they said, um, 
oh, we're so glad we could understand you. We were afraid you were going to be one of them. And again, I think they intended to compliment him with that. But what he heard was, you better not bring your parents, who don't speak that good of English, next time you come. And you know, I, I travel all around. I get, because of my job, I get to preach in situations like this pretty regularly. No one's ever told me I was afraid you were one of them. I have unearned advantages that my Hispanic brother in Christ does not have. Now, hear this, please. I don't think that the PCUSA is made up of people who are actively, aggressively racist. I don't believe that. I get to meet so many Presbyterians, so many places I go. I don't believe that at all. But I believe that we're part of a denomination and part of a culture that gives people who are white advantages that people of color don't receive. But I also don't tell you this to make you feel guilty. You know, none of us here, none of us worked hard so that we would have these advantages. None of us tried to rig the system so that we would get these advantages. None of us tried to have any, you know, tried to work towards these. These advantages have just come through the generations and the centuries down and were given to us. So I don't think we're supposed to feel guilty about it. I mean, think about the 5 p.m. workers that got $96. I don't think they felt guilty at all. But I bet they felt joy. And what you do with joy is spread it. And so my hope is that as you think about the unearned advantages that we who are white receive in our culture and in our church, that you'll think about what does it mean to share these advantages with others who don't receive them. What it would mean to work for justice and unity and reconciliation, like the confession is calling us to. And you're going to have the chance to do that during the year at these presbytery meetings. You're going to start this afternoon discussing these various themes, and then I think every meeting this year, um, one will be on justice, one will be on unity, one will be on reconciliation. You'll have a chance to really dig into these. And so my hope is that by the end of the, of the year, you're going to be a bright light for the rest of the denomination and the rest of the churches in Indianapolis of becoming a church like the one that my friend Princeton finally found. I told you Princeton has the gift of being long-suffering. So on the fourth Sunday, he was a new Christian. He did not let it stop him from wanting to go to church. So the fourth Sunday, he went to another church another all-white church. And this time, they didn't reject him. This time, they started what he calls a 40-year love affair. And they welcomed him into the church, and they nurtured his faith, and they helped him be equipped to be sent out into the world in Christ's mission, and they helped him explore his sense of call. Now he's a PCUSA pastor. This all-white church and their Nigerian adopted son lived out what Belhar calls us to live out. And when Princeton talks about it, he is just filled with the joy of the Lord. He said that two years ago he was invited to go back to the church to do the funeral for the wife of the pastor who welcomed him there in 1975. Now, this wasn't a PCUSA church either. But my hope is, if we can think about those advantages we've been given that we didn't earn and didn't deserve, if we can study and pray that Belhar would come to life in us, that our churches, that we too,
two could have 40-year interracial love affairs like Princeton's. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.